anti-disestablishmentarianism. Ugh, yuck. Ugh, English is so slow. There's so many syllables all the time. Who thought this was a good idea? Okay, here's the plan. We make a new language based on English, but we remove all the syllables. Well, I guess we need some. Okay, we remove all syllables except one from every word. So everything is monosyllabic. Think about how fast we'll be able to talk without all those unnecessary syllables. But what is a syllable? No, I'm asking. Does anyone know? All I know is what I learned in elementary school, where you clap while talking and each clap is a syllable. Elementary. Uh, five. But I don't know why we know when to clap. And at this point, I'm a bit afraid to ask. Like, I could clap while talking. Elementary. Six, seven. Who knows? Okay, fine. I'll look it up. What is a syllable? Apparently, it's all about vowel sounds. Was I just not paying enough attention in elementary school and everyone else already knows this? Uh, every syllable has exactly one vowel sound, and you can tack some extra consonants on top. But it's not like anyone planned the English language. Everyone knows what a hodgepodge it is, so how can syllables be so neatly described? Well, it's not an English language thing. It's just a human language thing. Digging deeper, it's all about the sonority sequencing principle. Sounds scary, but it's not. Each different type of sound we can make has a different inherent loudness to it. Keeping your speaking volume constant, some sounds produce more air movement than others. If we rank all the sounds we can make by how loud they are, we see a trend appear. Vowel sounds, spoken with a relatively open vocal tract, are the loudest type of sounds. The sonority sequencing principle says that in practice, human speech tends to follow a pattern of building up consonant loudness towards vowels, then back down away from them. This forms little triangles around vowels. So in a word like blimp, B sounds come before L, come before I in our hierarchy. Then it goes back down to M and to P after the I vowel. This isn't always true, by the way, but it's a general principle, and humans sure love general principles. Pop quiz, what's wrong with this made-up word? You probably think, that's dumb, that can never be an English word, it looks so wrong, it's garbage, you're an idiot. But now you know why it's garbage. This garbage word clearly violates the sonority sequencing principle. Look, the sonority of this garbage word would look like a roller coaster, instead of looking like a um, less fun roller coaster. This sequencing is what gives speech a sense of rhythm. The pattern of loudness gives a beat for speech, which is why it matters for poetry in Shakespeare. It helps distinguish each word from each other. Look. All speech is just a set of triangles. If it's not obvious yet, a syllable is just one of these triangles, and multisyllabic words are just several triangles stapled together. So it's true that syllables are based on vowel sounds, but the underlying reason is this sonority sequencing. The low points in the triangles are lower volume and therefore form natural breaks in words and the cadence of speech. Now that we're all experts in syllables, you can see why making everything monosyllabic will revolutionize the modern world. Look, our speech pattern will be so optimal. Why use many word when a few word do trick? Okay, ground rules before we make everything monosyllabic. One, we want every word to be one syllable. I guess that's the whole point. Two, words should try to follow the sonority sequencing principle so they're pronounceable. Three, we don't want to introduce more homophones than already exist. So no mapping two different words to the same syllable. Otherwise, like, what's the point? Every word is duck. Done. It's all one syllable. Duck, 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 duck. Four. I'll be focusing on North American English for simplicity, though the same concept could be applied to other languages and dialects. Okay, okay, but as soon as we try to end multisyllabic words, we realize that English is a bit of a train derailment in terms of spelling. Like, who would have thought that this is how you should spell thought? If you say thought, it's more like three parts. Th, ah, so we're going to throw away letters and focus on sounds. We can represent sounds with a special alphabet called IPA that has symbols for every different sound you can make. Thought is spelled like this. Thought. Frankly, I think that's what the alphabet really should be. This also helps us solve another problem. When making new monosyllabic versions of words, we don't want to have two different words with the same spellings and not realize it. Well, if we're always acting on sounds instead of letters, we don't have to care about spelling. Cancel the spelling tests! Boycott spelling bees! Okay, we're ready to do the thing. For every word in English that's more than one syllable, we want to assign it a new, unique monosyllabic form. 
There's many ways to make such an assignment, and there's only so many single syllables we can make, so we're going to have to make some decisions in order to make this monosyllabic English actually good. Here's the plan. Step 1. Get a list of all the words in English, plus a mapping of words to their IPA equivalents split into syllables. Step 2. Leave all the monosyllabic words alone. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Step 3. Sort the list of words by their frequency of use. We want to prioritize assigning good and short syllables to words that people actually use. No sense assigning a nice easy syllable like ver to verisimilitude rather than over. If we sort words by frequency and make our assignments in order one by one, then all the good syllables will get used up first and the nonsense words like avuncular can get the scraps. Step 4. Let's start actually assigning words. And uh, this is the hard part. Our first strategy will be to take existing syllables from the word and use it directly, as long as it's not already a word or already been assigned. Let's call this plan A. For example, changes. It has two syllables, chain and juz. Juz is not a word yet, so let's just make juz be the monosyllabic version of changes. This is great when it works, but this only works for a couple thousand words. Now that juz has been used, we can't use it for pages or images, etc. If that doesn't work, our next strategy will be to generate a new syllable based on the sounds in the word. To do this, we need to be able to generate new, random, English-like syllables. We want this to follow the sonority sequencing principle we talked about. This gets a little complicated. To generate random syllables, we'll build a data structure called a directed graph. It's a fancy name for something simple some IPA letters with arrows going between them. What we want is a way to tell which sounds come after which other sounds in real English words. To build this, we'll go through every sound, in every syllable, in every word in English. I think it's easiest to see with an example. If we were looking at the word bat, we'd see that the b sound is followed by an a sound. So we draw an arrow between b and a in the directed graph. Then we see that the a is followed by t, so we draw another arrow between a and t. If we see the same pair of letters again, like a to t in rat, we make the a to t arrow a little thicker. As we continue with every other pair of sounds in every other word, we end up building a web of how sounds connect to each other. This web entirely encodes the sonority sequencing principle in English without us actually explaining to the computer how that works. There's an edge from b to r, but not from r to b. Now that we have this fancy graph, we can randomly traverse between sounds, weighted by how often different edges are used. So for example, at the start, we pick a random sound that we've seen at the start of a syllable. Then we look at all the outgoing arrows from that sound in our directed graph. We pick one randomly, but weighted by the size of that arrow. Then we just keep going, picking random arrows until we reach the end of the syllable. This pretty magically generates syllables that kind of look like the real plausible English syllables. Spling, kinch, foms, drith, schneck, glid. The best part is you can just generate thousands and thousands of these things. Spling! You could also use this approach to learn what letters link to others between syllables and how often, which would let you generate fake multisyllable words. But we won't bother with that here. With this fancy graph at our disposal, we can make better monosyllabic assignments. If plan A doesn't work, then plan B is to do this random syllable generation but limit our palette of possible sounds to ones that already exist in the word. For example, we take all the sounds in the word color, k, u, uh, l, er. We throw away all the other letters in our graph except for these. Then randomly generate a syllable as before with this palette of sounds. For example, we might get cl. This works pretty well, but eventually this also starts to break down. So plan C is to just generate a metric ton of random syllables of any combination of letters and see if any kind of match up with the original word's letters. So you might get a good match like cannibalism as kibs, or you might get a garbage mapping like breadbox as scrud. Worst case scenario, none of the letters line up, and we just pick a random syllable and assign it to the word. Luckily, this only has to happen on very rare words after our good strategies fail. Side note. There's one small thing we can improve slightly. There's a lot of words that are very similar to other words, like bubble and bubbles and bubbled. These are sometimes called allomorphs, which would also be a totally badass name for a space creature made out of a metal alloy that can morph. 
Anyway, when generating random syllables, we can check if the sonority graph we generated is okay with us adding any extra sounds like d, ng, z to represent these variants. When assigning syllables, we can try to match up these syllables with variants first when possible, so that bubbles and bubbling aren't totally different. This only helps a little because it doesn't work every time. And that's it. It actually finds a mapping for every word with this approach. We'll call this new language glish, which incidentally is how you say English, English. English, English, English. So how does it do? Let's take a look at a sample paragraph. The lol ramp left is what we should use as a splom preft. I perhaps we could just make up some draw words. Oh, hey, what bauft jung's this preft that I'm saying right now? Wait, I've dreamed been saying this in glish with zings. This preft has meted five ept earth sibs than the slurged. Um, okay, right. It kind of does the thing. The multisyllable words do in fact become new single syllables. Some words are not bad, like sibs for syllable, preft for paragraph. Some you could believe if you squint really hard, like dree for all red d and bauft for about. Some are bad, like meded for 30, like WTF is that? Well, I guess it technically matched my requirements, so I'll give it a B minus and call it a day. It does generally reduce the number of syllables in a paragraph by 30%. I suppose it even has some kind of prosody to it. I was kind of hoping it would be mostly intelligible for English speakers without having to learn a bunch of new words, but that's not exactly the case. There's just too many words to make a mapping that's immediately obvious and unambiguous, at least with my simple method. Most individual word mappings seem reasonable, but it's not obvious what any given glish word actually means in English. It does really help that most words are already monosyllabic. I think of it like a sister language to English full of idiosyncrasies that you just have to memorize, just like English. I made a translator tool that you can type into and it spits out glish. It converts the IPA symbols back into something that vaguely resembles English spelling, so it's a bit easier to read. The code is also available online. Now we just need Duolingo for glish.